It'd be wonderful if life never tempted you, if you could just go day to day winging it and always do right. But that's not how the world is. That's not who you are. If left to our own devices, with enough opportunities, eventually we'll mess up. We'll drift, we'll stray. That's why the greats have what Marcus Aurelius called epithets for the self, or what General Mattis has called flat-ass rules. Know what you stand for and stick to it, he said. Draw the line and hold it. Stoicism, in theory, is a philosophy. As a practice, it is a set of rules to live by. The Stoics believed that life was complicated, more importantly, that it was exhausting. So to create rules was to help ensure that we stay on the right path, that we don't let the complexity and the nuance of each individual scenario allow us to compromise on the big, high standards we know we hold. One of the most relatable moments in Marcus Aurelius's meditations is the argument Marcus Aurelius has with himself in the opening of Book 5. It's clearly an argument he's had with himself many times, on many mornings, as have many of us. He knows he has to get out of bed, but so desperately wants to remain under the warm covers. It's relatable, but it's also impressive. Marcus didn't actually have to get out of bed. He didn't really have to do anything. One of his predecessors, Tiberius, basically abandoned the throne for an exotic island. Marcus's adopted great-grandfather Hadrian hardly spent any time in Rome at all. The emperor had all sorts of prerogatives, and here Marcus was insisting that he rise early and get to work. Why? It's because Marcus knew that winning the morning was key to winning the day and winning at life. He wouldn't have heard the expression that the early bird gets the worm, but he was well aware that a day well begun is half done. But it begs the question, what do his winning the morning actually look like? What should one do after they wake up early? From the Stoics, we glean three habits that make the morning a success. Journal. Take a walk. Do deep work. Let's look at each of those individually. The Stoics were big fans of journaling. If you're a daily Stoic subscriber, you've definitely heard us say that in an email or two. Epictetus the slave, Marcus Aurelius the emperor, Seneca the power broker and playwright. These three radically different men led radically different lives. But journaling, they all had that habit in common. Marcus Aurelius's meditations consists of a collection of personal self-help notes, which he never intended to see the light of day. And Epictetus encouraged his students to write down their thoughts and reflect upon their actions every day. The Stoic keeps watch over himself as over an enemy lying in ambush, he said. More recently, Oscar Wilde, Susan Sontag, W. H. Auden, Queen Victoria, John Quincy Adams, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, Virginia Woolf, Joan Didion, John Steinbeck, Sylvia Plath, Mary Chestnut, Brian Koppelman, Anais Nin, Franz Kafka, Martina Navratilova, Ben Franklin, and we'll stop there. All journalers. And for good reason, it works. There are few habits as time-tested and researched-backed as journaling. It clarifies the mind, provides room for quiet, private reflection. It gives one a record of their thoughts over time. It prepares you for the day ahead. There is no better way to start the day than with a journal. The Stoics sought stillness. It is with a still mind that one does their best work. The paradox is that perhaps the single best way to still one's mind is to put the body in motion. Runners and cyclists will tell you that this is true like an equation is true, that it is a fact. But you don't even have to go that far or that hard with your physical exertion to get what the Stoics were after. We should take wandering outdoor walks, Seneca said, so that the mind might be nourished and refreshed. Take a walk in the parking lot before you head into the office. Take a walk around the neighborhood. Take a walk to the local coffee shop and back. By the time you're done, you'll be in the perfect headspace to concentrate on what's in front of you like a Roman, Marcus Aurelius wrote. Do it like it's the last and most important thing in your life. From his stepfather, Antoninus, Marcus learned how to work long hours, how to stay in the saddle. He writes in meditations that he admired how Antoninus even scheduled his bathroom breaks so he could work for long, uninterrupted periods. Ryan Holiday talks about how he does two to three hours of deep work first thing when he gets to his office. James Clear, author of the wonderful bestseller Atomic Habits, told us on the Daily Stoic podcast that he carves out two sacred hours in the morning to do his writing. 
that's it. I know it probably doesn't seem like a lot, Holiday explains, but the Stoics knew that good work is realized by small steps. It's not a small thing, but good work is created in small steps. The day so easily gets away from us. Well-intentioned plans fall apart. Our willpower evaporates. So it's key that we prioritize the important things, and it's key that we habitualize doing them early. Well begun is half won, so get started. The chief task in life is simply this, to identify and separate matters, so that I can say clearly to myself which are externals not under my control and which have to do with the choices I actually control. The single most important practice in Stoic philosophy is differentiating between what we can change and what we can't, what we have influence over and what we do not. What does this look like in practice? Sports are a good example. An athlete can't control if the other team cheats or that refs always get the calls right. They can't control if people in the media know what they are talking about or if they stake out positions just to be controversial or contrarian. They can't control the weather or the conditions on the field. So what does that leave? One thing, their own performance. As Marcus Aurelius would say, it doesn't matter what other people say or think, it only matters what you do. You're not crazy to worry. Bad things could happen related to any of them. A car accident, an economic downturn, a surprise diagnosis. But let's go backwards in time. A month, a year, five years ago. What were you worried about then? Mostly the same things, right? And how many of those worries came to pass, as Mark Twain quipped quip, I am an old man and have known a great many troubles, but most of them never happened. And even the ones that did come to pass, clearly the worrying didn't help stop it, right? It was Seneca who put the best one-liner to this feeling. We are more often frightened than hurt, and we suffer more from imagination than from reality. So, what I advise you to do is, Seneca continued, do not be unhappy before the crisis comes. We are in the habit of exaggerating, or imagining, or anticipating sorrow. Don't anticipate sorrow. Don't let anxiety and worry get the best of you. Don't let your worries grow out of proportion to what might actually happen. Don't let imagination overtake reality. Marcus Aurelius had an interesting metaphor. He believed that a man, an emperor, a soldier, everyone was like a rock. Throw the rock up in the air, he said, and it loses nothing by coming down and gained nothing by going up. The rock stays the same. We can imagine his own life mirror this analogy. He was an ordinary man plucked by Hadrian to become emperor. Yet he could have been equally dethroned at any moment as well, and late in his reign nearly was. Did this change who Marcus was? Did it mean he was better or worse than other people? No, he was still the same rock. And so are you. Whether you have a day that begins with a promotion or ends with a firing, you're the same. Whether you win the lottery or file for bankruptcy, whether you address a crowd of thousands or have trouble getting your calls returned. The question is, how we're going to respond to these swings of fate if we can follow the lines of Kipling's classic poem, if, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same, you're the same. Success or failure, highs and lows, they don't change you. They are outside you. These are indifference. You stay the same. Well-being is attained by little and little, and nevertheless is no little thing itself. We don't know a lot about Lucilius, only that he was from Pompeii. He was a Roman knight. He was the imperial procurator in Sicily, then its governor. He owned a country villa in Ardea. For all his success, though, we get the sense that he struggled with many of the things we all struggle with. Anxiety, distraction, fear, temptation, self-discipline. So it's good that he had a friend like Seneca, someone who cared about him, told him the truth and gave him advice. One of the best pieces of advice from Seneca was actually pretty simple. Each day, he told Lucilius, you should acquire something that... This is the way to curbing our procrastinating tendencies. Remembering that incremental, consistent, humble, persistent work is the way to improvement. Your business, your book, your career, your body, it doesn't matter. You build them with little things day after day. Arnold Schwarzenegger is a filmmaker, entrepreneur, author, former governor, professional bodybuilder, and father of five. He's also a fan of the Stoics, 
and said in a video to people trying to stay strong and sane during the pandemic. Just as long as you do something every day, that is the important thing. Whether it's from Seneca or Arnold, good advice is good advice and truth is truth. One thing a day adds up. One step at a time is all it takes. You just got to get one small win and the sooner you start, the better you'll. He was talking less of physical beauty, one imagines, than of true beautiful human behavior, but actually it applies to both. A stunning woman whose looks are the result of her vanity and self-obsession will be rather unattractive when you get to know her. A man with strapping muscles acquired through steroids and a neglect of all other concerns is not really that impressive. Beauty, then, is difficult to separate from the intention, the choices which create it. So if you'd like to look better, that gives you a good place to start, in your choices but also in your motivations and intentions. It's the decision to get out of bed early and go for a run, so you can be around to see your children grow up, not so you can look good in the mirror. Do your makeup because it gives you confidence, because the ritual of applying it is some quiet time to yourself, not to cover up your flaws. Hire a trainer because you want to learn the discipline of weightlifting or boxing, not because you just want someone to tell you what to do. Things can get between you and your goal, of course, but nothing can stop you from getting started. Nothing can stop you from making a beautiful choice for yourself today. Every time you are faced with a choice today, between walking the 15 minutes or taking an Uber, between picking up the phone to have the difficult conversation or leaving it to an email, between taking responsibility or hoping it goes unnoticed, choose the more difficult option, the option that challenges you the most. Now, unlike any other moment in recent memory, we are being forced to reevaluate things. We're looking at our jobs, at our finances, at the places we live. We're looking at so many of the systems that have been set up, whether they're governmental or cultural or familial. We're having to ask questions about why they are what they are, how they've held up under the immense pressure and stress of this global pandemic. You can imagine Marcus Aurelius doing a bit of this himself. He too experienced a plague and was forced to spend years far from Rome with the army. There in his tent he sat with his journal, the pages that would become meditations, and he had a conversation with himself. One of the best passages survives to us and is worth applying to our own lives right now under similar stress and uncertainty. Most of what we say and do is not essential, he writes. If you can eliminate it, you'll have more time and more tranquility. Ask yourself, every day, every moment, how much or how little you work, where you live, what your marriage or your relationships look like, the political policies you support, what you spend money on, what your goals are, the way your schedule is arranged, the things taking up room in your junk drawer, or the thoughts running through your head. Most of what we do is not essential. Most of it is instinctual, or it was foisted on us by someone else. Most of it isn't actually working for us. We might be better and happier if we changed. The great German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche would describe his formula for human greatness as amor fati, a love of fate. That one wants nothing to be different, not forward, not backwards, not in all eternity. Not merely bear what is necessary, still less conceal it, but love it. The Stoics were not only familiar with this attitude, but they embraced it. Two thousand years earlier, Marcus Aurelius would say, A blazing fire makes flame and brightness out of everything that is thrown into it. Stuff goes wrong. It's a fact of life. As Seneca said, fortune behaves just as she pleases. His own life was proof of that. A health flare-up disrupted his career. An emperor exiled him. He clawed his way back, only to have it happen again. Nearly all of this was out of Seneca's control. The only part that was up to him was how he chose to see these events and what he chose to do with them. He chose to see them as a good thing. He chose to use them. He chose to dye these events with his own color. Oh, the mission got canceled. Good. We can focus on another one. Didn't get the new high-speed gear we wanted. Good. We can keep it simple. Didn't get promoted. Good. More time to get better. 
Didn't get funded? Good. We own more of the company. Didn't get the job you wanted? Good. Go out, gain more experience, and build a better resume. Got injured? Good. Needed a break from training? Got tapped out? Good. It's better to tap out in training than tap out on the street. Got beat? Good. We learned. Unexpected problems? Good. We have to figure out solutions. This is a stoic prescription. This is the stoic prescription. It's also the prescription for leadership, for entrepreneurship, for resiliency. Life throws stuff at you. You are the one who decides to lay down and let it bury you or to make hay out of it. You are the one who decides whether to bury your head in the sand and hope it goes away or to look it square in the eye, as bad as it is, and say good. These are your choices. And choosing rightly, choosing to see the bad things as ultimately good, is all you can do. It's what you must do. Because people are depending on you. Because you believe in your ability to make it good. Because you have but one life to live. The founder of Stoicism, Zeno, was a young man when he was given a cryptic piece of advice. To live the best life, the oracle told Zeno, you should have conversations with the dead. What does that mean? Like with ghosts and goblins? Go spend time chatting in a cemetery? No, of course not. The oracle was talking about reading. Because it's through books that we really talk to people who are no longer with us. Their bodies may be rotting in the ground or long since turned to dust, but in the pages of a book, they are alive and well. Harry Truman was one of the greatest readers to ever occupy the White House. As a friend observed, to Harry, history was the men who made it, and he spoke of Marcus Aurelius or Henry of Navarre or old Tom Jefferson or old Andy Jackson as if they were friends and neighbors with whom he had only recently discussed the affairs of the day, their day. When Truman said that not all readers are leaders, but all leaders are readers, we felt like he was talking to us. We built our daily stoic read-to-lead challenge around that piece of advice from him, as if he was still here, not dead for nearly 50 years. That's the beauty and the power of books. They can bring the past to life. They can annex, as Seneca said, all ages into your own. You can put yourself in the same room as Lincoln. You can chat with Shakespeare. You can be inspired by Porchicato. To do this isn't scary. In fact, it's the opposite. It's incredibly reassuring because it means you have permanent access to the wisest men and women who ever lived. Be tolerant with others and strict with yourself. Marcus Aurelius. Cato hated excess. He hated finery. He hated luxury. He thought to indulge such things was weakness and stupidity. And so what did Cato think of his brother who was far less strict about these things? He loved him. In fact, he worshipped him. It's important to remember, the Stoic has strict standards. We have strong opinions on what's right and what isn't. But, and this is a big but, we have to be understanding and forgiving of those who have been, as Marcus Aurelius writes, cut off from truth. This observation from Marcus Aurelius's most thoughtful biography by Ernest Renan explains the right way to do it. The consequence of austere philosophy might have produced stiffness and severity. But here it was that the rare goodness of the nature of Marcus Aurelius shone out in all its brilliancy. His severity was confined only to himself. That's exactly the key. Your standards are for you. Marcus's rule was to be strict with yourself and tolerant with others. That's the line that Cato walked with his brother. That's what we have to figure out with the folks who, in today's world, live in a very unstoic way. There are consequences for their actions, of course especially when those actions or choices are unjust. But we don't need to cast them out of our lives or write them off as worthless or awful. We can still engage with them. We can see them at Christmas. We can let them into our lives in a way that is safe or respectful to our boundaries. We can accept that people can see things in a different way and let them live as they wish, again, so long as those choices aren't hurting other people. We can, to borrow an old expression, hate the sin while still loving the sinner, because what they do, how they act, is not up to us. The good we choose to still see in them, that's in our control. Our inward power, when it obeys nature, reacts to events by accommodating itself to what it faces, to what is possible. It needs no specific material. 
It pursues its own aims as circumstances allow. It turns obstacles into fuel. As a fire overwhelms what would have quenched a lamp. What's thrown on top of the conflagration is absorbed, consumed by it, and makes it burn still higher. Marcus Aurelius One way to go through life is to turn away from the things that are hard. You can close your eyes and ears to what is unpleasant. You can take the easy way, foregoing difficulty whenever possible. The other way is the stoic way. It entails not only not avoiding hardship, but actively seeking it out. Marguerite Yersinar has Hadrian write to young Marcus Aurelius about his philosophy for learning and benefiting from all of life's adversity and unpleasantness. Whenever an object repelled me, he says, I made it a subject of study, ingeniously compelling myself to extract from it a motive for enjoyment. If faced with something unforeseen or near cause for despair, like an ambush or a storm at sea, after all measures for the safety of others had been taken, I strove to welcome this hazard, to rejoice in whatever it brought me of the new and unexpected, and thus without shock, the ambush or the tempest was incorporated into my plans or my thoughts. Even in the throes of my worst disaster, I have seen a moment when sheer exhaustion reduced some part of the horror of the experience, and when I made the defeat a thing of my own and being willing to accept it. Of course, this is fiction so Hadrian never said such a thing, but clearly somebody taught Marcus a lesson along those lines because Meditations is filled with similar passages. Marcus writes about how a fire turns everything that is thrown into it into flame. He says that obstacles are actually fuel. The impediment to action advances action, he writes. What stands in the way becomes the way. It's a beautiful way to approach the world, and ultimately, the only one suited for our unpredictable and stressful times. Take someone like Laura Ingalls Wilder, who had a hard scrabble existence. From the Kansas prairies to the backwoods of Florida, she and her family eked out a life from some of the most unforgiving environments on the planet. She endured and eventually thrived despite this, due primarily to her stoic optimism. There is good in everything, she later wrote, if only we look for it. To avoid difficulty would mean complete retreat from life. It would mean hiding in ignorance. Worse, this would make you dreadfully vulnerable to crisis if it did ever find you. Instead, we must strive, as Hadrian said, to welcome hazard. We can rejoice in the unexpected and even turn failure into something by deciding to own it. We can learn from unpleasantness and even soften our aversions. This will not be easy, but that's fitting, isn't it? We are not naturally attracted to obstacles, which is precisely why we must work on finding out how to like them. This is the way. It's easy to see death as this thing that lies off in the distant future. Even those of us who choose not to live in denial of our mortality can be guilty of this. We think of dying as an event that happens to us. It's stationary, whatever date it will happen at, and we're moving towards it slowly or quickly depending on our age and health. Seneca felt that this was the wrong way to think about it, that it was a mistaken view that enabled many bad habits and much bad living. Instead, he said death was a process. It was happening to us right now. We are dying every day, he said. Even as you read this email, time is passing that you will never get back. That time, he said, belongs to death. Powerful, right? Death doesn't lie off in the distance. It's with us right now. It's the second hand on the clock. It's the setting sun. As the arrow of time moves, death follows, claiming every moment that has passed. What ought we do about it? The answer is live. Live while you can. Put nothing off. Leave nothing unfinished. Seize it while it still belongs to us. Ever feel like you're playing life on hard mode, stressed, overwhelmed, tossed around by every external event? What if there was a secret weapon of philosophy forged in the fires of ancient Rome that could equip you to handle anything life throws your way? Welcome to the world of Stoicism and your crash course in mastering yourself. In this video, we're unlocking 13 battle-tested Stoic lessons that will turn you from a leaf buffeted by the wind into an unyielding oak rooted in wisdom and unshakable in your self-command. So ditch the anxiety, toss out the self-doubt, and get ready to become the master of your own destiny.
Buckle up, friends, because this journey into Stoicism is about to get epic. Leave a comment below with your biggest challenge, and I'll personally recommend some Stoic wisdom to help you overcome it. Remember, with Stoicism, you're not alone. You're part of a long line of warriors who have faced down life storms and emerged stronger. Now it's your turn. Let's go. Lesson number one, cultivate self-awareness. The renowned Stoic philosopher Epictetus once stated, we may not have control over our external circumstances, but we always retain the power to choose our responses. This assertion succinctly underscores the significance of developing self-awareness, serving as a fundamental initial stride toward achieving self-mastery. Self-awareness surpasses a mere understanding of personal preferences or idiosyncrasies. It involves a profound comprehension of one's internal landscape, comprising thoughts, emotions, and the motives steering one's actions. It resembles a lighthouse that steers individuals through the tumultuous seas of life, shedding light on concealed currents and potential pitfalls that could divert them off course. The question then arises, how can one nurture this invaluable self-awareness? Drawing inspiration from Stoic practices, self-examination emerges as a key approach. This entails turning the lens of observation inward, scrutinizing thoughts and feelings with a gentle inquisitiveness rather than judgment, analogous to a scientist impartially studying a phenomenon. This method involves observing internal processes without attachment or condemnation. Journaling. Dedicate quiet moments daily to contemplate thoughts and experiences. Identify triggers for specific emotions. Assess responses to challenges and recognize emerging patterns. Meditation. Engage in mindfulness practices to detach from thoughts allowing observation of their transient nature. This aids in avoiding being swept away by their currents, self-inquiry throughout the day. Pause to ask questions such as what am I currently feeling? Why do I feel this way? What principles guide me in this situation? Feedback, solicit honest feedback from trusted friends and family. Regarding your behavior and presentation, their insights can offer valuable perspectives that may have escaped your notice. Through the cultivation of self-awareness, individuals gain a profound understanding of their values, strengths, and weaknesses. This understanding empowers them to make deliberate choices aligned with their principles, rather than being impulsively driven by emotions or external influences. It equips them to confront challenges with composure and resilience, secure in the knowledge that their inner world remains a sanctuary, even amidst external turbulence. It is crucial to recognize that the journey of cultivating self-awareness is ongoing, a continuous process rather than a final destination. Patience, acknowledgement of progress, and an unwavering commitment to exploring one's inner depths characterized this expedition. It is through this internal exploration that individuals discover the authentic captain, within ready to navigate any storms that life may present. Lesson number two, tame the mind monkey. Picture a playful monkey agile and ceaselessly moving, leaping from one branch of thought to another within your mind. This represents the undisciplined mind as envisioned by the Stoic philosopher Seneca, persistently oscillating between past regrets and future anxieties, veiling the inherent wisdom and tranquility at your core. Seneca's reminder he suffers more than necessary, who suffers before it is necessary, underscores the stoic approach to liberate oneself from unnecessary distress through the mastery of the mind, particularly through mindfulness meditation. Mindfulness serves as the gentle guide for this untamed mental monkey. Instead of suppressing or controlling thoughts, mindfulness encourages observation with curiosity and acceptance, akin to a scientist. Studying a captivating phenomenon, various practices inspired by stoic principles of present moment focus aid in this endeavor, breath awareness. Center your attention on the rhythmic flow of your breath, each inhalation and exhalation refreshing your mind body scan. Tenderly scan your body, noting sensations without judgment, a tingling foot, a warm hand, a subtle tension in your shoulders. Present moment, immersion, Engage fully in the current activity, such as washing dishes, 
relishing the sensations of soapy water, the touch of ceramic, and the sound of flowing water be present in every fold of a napkin and every bite of breakfast. These techniques gradually fostered detachment from mental turbulence, enabling worries about the future and regrets about the past to dissipate to like passing clouds, revealing a clear ski of inner peace, reduce its stress and anxiety by focusing on the present concerns about the future and remorse about the past diminish, leading to decreased stress and a sense of tranquility, improved focus and concentration. The ability to observe thoughts without entanglement enhances concentration and task-oriented focus, heightened self-awareness, observing reactions and patterns, fosters a profound self-understanding, facilitating self-acceptance and personal growth, inner peace and joy, letting go of mental attachments and nurturing present moment awareness unveils an internal reservoir of peace and joy, independent of external circumstances. Taming the mind monkey is an ongoing endeavor rather than a one-time achievement. There will be days when the mental monkey appears particularly agile, swinging through a jungle of anxieties. Practice patience. With each mindful breath and each gentle observation of thoughts, you progress toward inner serenity and the concealed. Wisdom within, as Seneca wisely counsels. The greatest remedy for those who are afraid, lazy, or unhappy is work, care, and attention. Unroll your yoga mat, close your eyes, and embark on the liberating journey of calming your mind. Monkey one mindful moment at a time. Lesson number three, befriend your emotions. Envision emotions not as disruptive intruders, unsettling your inner calm, but as messengers carrying insights from the depths of your being. This viewpoint aligns with the philosophy of the Stoic Emperor, Marcus Aurelius, who famously asserted very little is needed to make a happy life. It is all within yourself, in your way of thinking. Contrary to considering emotions as adversaries, Stoicism, advocates for comprehension and acceptance rather than suppressing or fearing the full spectrum of emotions. The Stoic approach emphasizes recognizing and understanding their language. Just as a skilled sailor interprets the wind and waves, learn to navigate the currents of your feelings. To cultivate a friendship with your emotions, employ the Stoic principles, acknowledge, and label your emotions. Confront your feelings head on. Identify whether it's anger, sadness, joy, or a blend. Simply naming an emotion can diminish its intensity and facilitate easier management. Evaluate control. Instead of fixating on external triggers, focus on what lies within your control, the reactions, interpretations, and perspectives you choose. Embrace the full spectrum refrain from categorizing emotions as good or bad. Each emotion contributes to the human experience offering valuable insights into your needs and values. Practice mindfulness, observe thoughts and emotions without judgment. Techniques like meditation and Jerry Knowing Aid and developing mindful awareness, allowing you to understand their ebb and flow without being carried away by their waves. By cultivating a companionship with your emotions, you unlock numerous benefits, deeper self-understanding, recognizing and interpreting your Emotions provides a clearer picture of your inner landscape values and needs. Enhanced resilience. Accepting the entire spectrum of emotions, including those perceived as negative, equips you to navigate life's challenges with increased resilience and self-compassion, improved relationships. Understanding your emotions facilitates empathy towards others, fostering stronger and more meaningful connections, inner peace, and well-being. Embracing your emotional world cultivates a sense of inner harmony and well-being. Transcending external circumstances, befriending your emotions, is an ongoing journey, not a destination. There will be days when the emotional weather seems turbulent, but with each mindful breath and act of self-acceptance you progress toward mastering your inner seas. As Marcus Aurelius wisely declared, everything we have to find happiness is within ourselves. Embark on the voyage of self-discovery. Let your emotions be guides and discover your personal oasis of inner peace. Lesson number four, forge a disciplined spirit. Envision yourself as a sculptor skillfully wielding the chisel of discipline to carve the raw material of your character. 
This represents the essence of Stoic self-mastery, echoing the wisdom of Epictetus, a prominent Stoic philosopher. We have two ears and one mouth so that we can listen twice as much as we speak. By actively absorbing the teachings of philosophy and turning inward, we can refine our actions, molding a life infused with purpose and integrity. Discipline in the Stoic perspective is not a harsh taskmaster with a whip, but a gentle guide, emphasizing consistent action and self-compassion. It involves setting clear, smart goals aligned with personal values, establishing supportive routines, and holding oneself accountable with kindness and understanding. Set smart goals. Ensure goals are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound, providing a clear roadmap and allowing progress tracking established routines. Incorporate goals and values into daily or weekly routines, whether through morning meditation, study sessions, or workout schedules. Celebrate small wins. Acknowledge and celebrate each step toward goals, no matter how small. Fostering motivation through consistent progress recognition. Learn from setbacks. View mistakes as opportunities for learning and growth. Analyze setbacks. Adjust strategies if needed. And continue forward with newfound wisdom. Seek inspiration. Surround yourself with stories and insights from individuals embodying desired qualities. Engage with biographies, self-improvement podcasts, and motivational content. Forging a disciplined spirit is a lifelong journey, not a fleeting endeavor. There will be days when progress feels sluggish and the chisel seems heavy. Yet with persistent effort, unwavering self-compassion, and a commitment to personal values, you can gradually sculpt a life characterized by purpose, resilience, and inner peace. As Epictetus emphasizes, the chief task in life is simply this identifying and separating matters so that I can say clearly to myself which are externals, not under my control, and which have to do with the choices I actually control. Embark on the path of self-mastery guided by Stoic wisdom and discover the sculptor within poise to craft your unique masterpiece of character. Lesson number five, nurture your body temple. Envision your body as a sacred temple of vessel guiding you through the ebb and flow of life. The Stoics pragmatic in their philosophy, advocated for taking care to get what is good, emphasizing the importance of honoring and nurturing the physical self as the bedrock for a sound mind. Show the utmost reverence to your temple, just as you wouldn't neglect a cherished building. Attend to the needs of your body. Here are ways to cultivate a Stoic-inspired respect for your physical self. Nourish with intention. Provide your temple with wholesome foods that energize and revitalize. Consider fresh fruits, vegetables, whole grains, lean proteins and healthy fats. Recognize that food is not just fuel. It is an act of self-care. Move with joy. Exercise is not merely a checkbox on a to-do list. Engage in activities that bring you pleasure, whether it's dancing to music, taking a nature walk, or participating in a team sport. Prioritize rest. Like the ocean needs calm nights for replenishment, your body craves restorative sleep. Establish a consistent sleep schedule. Create a relaxing bedtime routine and recognize quality sleep is essential for both physical and mental well-being. Listen to your whispers, tune into your body. Subtle cues respond to hunger with nourishment and fatigue with rest. By actively listening to its signals, you foster a harmonious relationship, ensuring the flourishing of your temple. Remember, the Stoics emphasize that a healthy body is not mere vanity. It is a prerequisite for virtuous living. A robust, well-nourished body enables you to confront challenges with resilience, approach daily tasks with enthusiasm, and contribute meaningfully to the world. Caring for your body temple is not self-indulgence. It is responsible stewardship. It is an acknowledgement of the vessel carrying your unique spirit, the instrument facilitating your experience of life's richness. With each healthy choice and mindful movement, you fortify your foundation empowering yourself to navigate life seas with grace and purpose. Embark on this journey of self-respect guided by stoic wisdom. Listen to your body, nourish it with love and move with joy. 
Your temple is a sacred space, a testament to your strength and resilience and the cornerstone for a life of well-being and flourishing. Lesson number six, embrace continuous learning. Visualize the world as an infinite playground of wisdom, teeming with knowledge waiting to be uncovered. This perspective championed by the Stoics asserts that genuine freedom resides not in material possessions or external circumstances, but in the pursuit of knowledge and self-improvement. As Seneca, a prominent Stoic thinker, declared, he who is brave is free to claim your inner freedom, embrace the journey of continuous learning and become a perpetual student. Here are ways to fuel your Stoic-inspired thirst for knowledge. Read voraciously. Let your mind absorb diverse perspectives and insightful ideas. Dive into philosophical texts, explore historical accounts, and lose yourself in captivating novels. Each book unveils a new window to the world, expanding your understanding and enriching your inner landscape. Seek mentors and teachers. Surround yourself with individuals embodying qualities you aspire to cultivate. Learn from their experiences. Engage in stimulating conversations and glean wisdom from their insights. Mentorship isn't confined to formal settings. Wise friends, inspiring colleagues, or passionate online communities can all be valuable teachers embrace new experiences. Step beyond your comfort zone and embark on adventures that challenge preconceived notions traveled to new destinations, immerse yourself in unfamiliar cultures, and acquire new skills. Every experience, even seemingly daunting ones, has the potential to teach valuable lessons about yourself and the world. Take courses and workshops. Invest in expanding your knowledge by enrolling in courses or attending workshops aligned with your interests. Whether a language class, coding boot camp, or creative writing workshop, each structured learning experience equips you with new skills and broadens your horizons. Engage in active learning. Don't be a passive consumer of information. Question what you read, challenge assumptions, and foster critical thinking. Discuss your learnings with others. Participate in online forums and document your reflections. Active engagement transforms information into knowledge integral to your personal growth. The pursuit of knowledge is not a sprint to a finish line. It's a lifelong journey propelled by curiosity and a genuine desire to comprehend the world and oneself better at. As the Stoics emphasize, the important thing is not to stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing. Embrace the boundless playground of wisdom surrounding you. Read with an open mind. Explore with a fearless spirit and learn with unyielding curiosity. This, my friend, is the route to genuine freedom. Freedom arising from expanding your inner world and cultivating wisdom to guide you toward a life of purpose and fulfillment. Lesson number seven. Build a tribe of supportive souls. Envision standing atop a majestic mountain, the wind playing through your hair, while you take in the breathtaking vista below. The thrill of reaching the summit is undoubtedly powerful. But what makes the experience truly unforgettable? It's the company you shared on the climb. The camaraderie, encouragement, and shared triumph over each challenge together at its essence. This is the core of building a tribe of supportive souls. As Seneca the Stoic philosopher wisely stated, true happiness is to enjoy the present without anxious dependence upon the future. While the journey to self-mastery is inherently a solo endeavor, it doesn't necessitate traveling alone. The Stoics recognize the vital role of community in nurturing individual growth and shared joy, advocating for surrounding oneself with those who uplift and inspire. Seek mentors. Identify wise individuals embodying the qualities you aspire to develop. Whether older colleagues, inspiring teachers, or online figures learn from their experiences, seek their guidance and let their wisdom illuminate your path. Connect with like-minded individuals, harness the power of shared interests and values, engage with online communities, participate in workshops, or join local clubs aligned with your passions. Building connections with those who share your intellectual curiosity or creative fire provides companionship, support, and diverse perspectives. Foster a supportive community. Be the catalyst for connection in your life. Initiate conversations with friends and family. Organize book clubs or discussion groups centered around your interests. 
or create a network of like-minded individuals who inspire and motivate one another. Celebrate victories together. A genuine community thrives on shared joy. Celebrate each other's accomplishments, offer encouragement during challenges, and be a pillar of support on the collective journey toward progress. Remember, your tribe is not just a social circle, it's a haven for shared growth. These are the individuals reflecting your best self, challenging your thoughts and rejoicing in your progress with infectious enthusiasm. As the Stoics remind us, no man is an island, we are interconnected, woven into the fabric of humanity. By nurturing your tribe, you enrich not only your life, but also contribute to the well-being of those around you. Together you embark on a collective journey of self-discovery, supporting and inspiring one another to reach new heights. So embrace the connections life offers, seek mentors, build bridges with like-minded souls, and cultivate a community where mutual support fuels individual growth. In this tribe of supportive souls, you'll find not just camaraderie, but also the strength and joy derived from shared triumphs and collective wisdom. Together, you will script the most inspiring chapters of your individual stories, a testament to the power of connection and the beauty of shared journeys. Lesson number eight, practice compassion, both for yourself and others. Envision your heart as a fertile garden where the seeds of self-compassion can blossom into vibrant flowers of acceptance and joy. This is the essence of the stoic practice of extending kindness, not only outward, but inward as well. As Epictetus, the stoic philosopher wisely taught, we have the power to hold no opinion about a thing and to not let it upset our state of mind. This power extends to ourselves, allowing us to embrace our imperfections, celebrate our unique journey, and become our own fiercest cheerleader. Embrace forgiveness, acknowledge that stumbling and making mistakes are part of the human experience. Forgive yourself for missteps, learn from them and move forward with a lighter heart. Celebrate your individuality, embrace your authentic self, flaws and all. Recognize the uniqueness of your journey, celebrating the experiences, strengths and quirks that make you who you are. Be your own advocate, become your biggest supporter, Speak to yourself with the same kindness and encouragement you would offer a beloved friend. Cheer yourself on through challenges, acknowledge your progress, and celebrate victories big and small. Extend empathy. Practice seeing the world through the eyes of others, offering understanding and compassion instead of judgment. Recognize that everyone is on their own journey, facing their own struggles. Foster mindful connections. Be present in interactions. Listen actively and offer support without expectation. Genuine connections become fertile ground for mutual growth and shared humanity. Embrace shared humanity. Recognize the universal struggles and joys that bind us together. Foster a sense of belonging and shared purpose, acknowledging our interconnectedness, inner peace and resilience. Cultivating self-compassion provides a sense of inner peace, enabling you to navigate life's challenges with greater resilience deeper connections. Extending compassion to others builds bridges of empathy and understanding, leading to stronger, more meaningful relationships. A life of purpose. Recognizing our shared humanity inspires contribution to the well-being of others, creating a life filled with purpose and fulfillment. Cultivating self-compassion is an ongoing practice. There will Values and seek opportunities to express them through your actions and life's journey. Consider your impact. How do you want to contribute to the world leaving a positive footprint no matter how small can be a powerful motivator? Find ways to utilize your unique skills and talents to make a difference. Deeper meaning and fulfillment. Knowing your why infuses your life with meaning, turning daily tasks into stepping stones toward a larger goal. This sense of purpose fuels motivation and resilience helping you navigate chow hunches with a resolute spirit, greater clarity and focus, identifying your purpose aids, and prioritizing your choices and energies. Distractions and noise fade away when you have a clear destination, allowing you to focus on what truly matters, improved well-being. Living a purpose. Guided life positively impacts your mental and emotional well-being. The satisfaction of contributing to something larger brings inner peace and a sense of belonging to a greater whole. Remember, 
Finding your purpose is a journey, not a destination. It's an ongoing process of discovery, refining your inner compass as you navigate life's ever-changing waters. There will be days when fog obscures your path winds seem fickle, and doubts arise. Yet with each intentional step, each action aligned with your values, you unfurl the sails of your purpose, drawing closer to the harbor of a life well-lived, as Cicero wisely remarked, not to live at all is worse than not to live well. Don't settle for mere existence. Set your sights on a meaningful horizon. Listen to your soul's whispers and let your purpose guide you through life's grand adventure. So raise your sails, captain of your own ship, and embark on the exhilarating journey of discovering your why. The world awaits your unique contribution, and the winds of fortune favor those who know their destination. Lesson number 10. Embrace the power of gratitude. Picture your heart as a flourishing garden where seeds of gratitude lie patiently waiting for the light of awareness to coax them into vibrant blooms. This lies at the core of the Stoic practice of embracing gratitude. As Seneca, the wise Stoic philosopher, aptly declared true happiness is to enjoy the present without anxious dependence be days when your garden appears barren. But with perseverance and mindful nurturing, you can cultivate a landscape of self-acceptance, watch as your unique blossoms of acceptance and joy spread their vibrant petals, touching the lives of those around you. As Marcus Aurelius advised, the object of life is not to be on the side of the majority, but to stand with reason. Stand with the reason for yourself. Embrace the practice of self-compassion. 10. Do your inner garden with kindness and witness your blossoms of acceptance and joy flourish for all to see. Lesson number 9. Find your purpose, your why. Envision your life as a majestic ship gracefully traversing the vast ocean of time. The waves beckon and the wind carries promises. But do you know your destination? This is the essence of the quest for purpose, the guiding star that illuminates your unique path. As Seneca the Stoic philosopher wisely stated, if one does not know to which port one is sailing, no wind is favorable. Stoicism emphasizes that a life without purpose is akin to a ship adrift susceptible to the whims of any random current. It advocates not just action, but intentional action, propelled by a profound understanding of your passions, values, and aspirations. Discovering your why serves as the anchor that steadies you amidst life's storms and propels you forward even when the winds are gentle. Explore your passions. Delve into the depths of your curiosity. What activities ignite your soul? What brings you joy and a sense of fulfillment? From creative pursuits to intellectual endeavors, explore diverse avenues and let your passions be your guiding lights. Listen to your intuition. The Stoics valued the wisdom of the inner voice. Pay heed to the whispers of your gut, the intuitive nudges guiding you towards certain paths. Don't dismiss these subtle cues. They can be your compass amid life's chows. Align with your values. Identify the principles that matter most to you. Compassion, justice, creativity, learning. Recognize your core upon the future. Nurturing gratitude shifts your focus from perceived lack to the abundance that already envelops you. Nurturing your heart and enriching your life with joy. Practice daily reflection. Begin and end each day with a conscious reflection on the things you're grateful for the morning sunlight, a nourishing breakfast, or the simple miracle of breath. Cultivate a habit of acknowledging and appreciating the blessings that surround you. Find joy in the ordinary. Don't wait for grand events to spark gratitude. Discover delight in the everyday, the song of birds, the warmth of a hug, the laughter of a loved one. The seemingly small moments when embraced with awareness weave a tapestry of gratitude. Express thankfulness. Gratitude thrives when expressed. Let those who enrich your life know the depth of your appreciation, offer genuine thanks for their presence, kindness, or merely for being a part of your journey. Shift perspective and challenges. When faced with adversity, remind yourself of what remains. Practice reframing situations by 